you have your Bibles, John 19 is where we're going to be this morning. John 19. Um, we're continuing our study in John, and we're going to look um, this morning at the burial, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And so, John 19, and I'm going to read from verses 31, and we're going to go all the way down to verse 10 of John 20. So John 19, 31, to the 10th verse of the 20th chapter. And so... Um, Here's what, says, here's what the word says, verse 31. Since it was the preparation day, the Jews did not want the bodies to remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a special day. They requested that Pilate have the men's legs broken and that their bodies be taken away. And so the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other who had been crucified with them. And when they came to Jesus, they didn't break his legs since they saw that he had already died. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows he is telling the truth. For these things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones would be broken. Also another scripture that says they will look at the one they pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he would remove Jesus' body. Pilate gave him permission so that he, so he came and he took his body away. Nicodemus, who had previously come to him at night, also came, bringing a mixture of about 75 pounds of myrrh and aloe. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it in linen cloths with the fragrant spices according to the burial custom of the Jews. There was a garden in the place where he was crucified. A new tomb was there in the garden. No one had yet been placed in it. And they placed Jesus there because the Jewish day of preparation and since the tomb was nearby. And on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. She saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. And so she went running to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to him, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they put him. After that, Peter and the other disciple went out, headed for the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. And stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. And then following him, Simon Peter also came. He entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there, the wrapping that had been on his head was not lying with the linen cloth, but was folded up in a separate place by itself. The other disciples, who had reached the tomb first, then also went in, saw, and he believed. For they did not fully understand the scriptures that he must rise from the dead. And the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. This is by far the most profound, culture-altering, historic event in the world, and yet it's also one of the most highly disputed events in history. We've just went through Easter, and it seems like the only time media will talk about Christianity is over Christmas and Easter, and um, usually when they're doing it, it's to debunk the resurrection story or debunk the virgin birth story and last week um, I believe it was the New York Times that ran an article by the president of Union Theological Seminary that said you don't have to believe in the resurrection of Jesus to be a follower of Jesus and basically she went through the entire story of Jesus and said none of this none of it matters the virgin birth doesn't matter the miracles don't matter the resurrection doesn't matter the death doesn't matter and I'm like you're a president of the seminary we're screwed <laughs> and so um, but I mean it was a heartbreaking article to read that um, from people that have pro professed to be people of the word to say that this does not happen but you have to ask the question did Jesus really die was Jesus really buried? Did Jesus really come back from the grave? And are we really supposed to believe that someone 2,000 years ago walked this earth, died an absolutely brutal death, and walked right out of the grave three days later? See, this truth, this actual truth is essential not only to your life personally, but it's essential for the direction of the world. You see, Jesus single-handedly transformed cultures and people. He made eyes see again. 
He caused legs to walk again. He made the dead to be resurrected again. He made minds to be at peace again. He is the most fascinating, intriguing, famous person our world has ever seen. More songs have been written about Jesus. More artwork has been created about Jesus. More books have been written about Jesus than anyone else who has ever lived on the face of this earth. And yet, when you think about him, that's the most amazing thing. Because Jesus never traveled over a hundred miles from his home. He never held a political office, never aspired to be a politician. He never married. He never attended college. He never owned a business. He didn't have a Facebook account. He never tweeted a single tweet. He never took a selfie for his Instagram page. He never drank a coffee from Starbucks. He never watched Avengers Endgame. By the way, that is a phenomenal movie. And he never saw a single Academy Award winning film. He was born to an impoverished mom whose sacrifice and his dedication was a dove, a dove that was reserved for the poorest of the poor in the community. He grew up in a town called Nazareth where even one of his followers, when they were first told about Jesus, looked at his friend and said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? He lived the last three years of his life homeless and broke. He himself said that he had no place to lay his head. When illustrating taxes to the people, he had to borrow a coin from someone in the crowd to say, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God. His last week he rode into town on a borrowed donkey, had his last meal in a borrowed tomb, was crucified on a borrowed cross and was buried in a borrowed tomb. And yet he single-handedly turned this world upside down on its head. He changed the lives of people from the inside out. And this change cannot be chalked up to some good moral teaching or being a good role model for you and I. If, all that was, if that was all that Jesus did, Christianity would have ceased 2,000 years ago. It never would have taken off. Persecution would have snuffed it out. And yet what changed everything and everyone was the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. See, this reality couldn't stop the church from exploding in numbers. His followers knew that he rose again, and they were committed to this fact to the point that every one of them were killed for this fact. And the day of their death, there was martyrdom for each of the followers of Jesus. And we'll look at that in a little bit. People gave their lives for this belief that Jesus really died, was really buried, and was really rose again. Blaise Pascal put it this way, I believe those witnesses that get their throats cut. He was more than just a simple carpenter. He was more than just a profound teacher. He was more than just a miracle worker. He was more than just a social worker. He was more than just a supreme role model. He was God in human flesh, sent to redeem you and I and convert you. And friends, he's still in that business even today. Jesus really did die. He really was buried and he really rose from the grave. And as a result, what we see is that people's lives are really changed from the inside out and ours can be changed today as well. See, there is nothing in your life, absolutely nothing in your life this morning that cannot be transformed by the reality of the resurrection of Jesus. So let's take a moment this morning and look at four specific things. Number one, I want to look at how Jesus really died, how he was really buried, how he really rose from the dead, and how he really changed lives. There's a lot of reallys this morning, so he really did this stuff. Number one, Jesus really died. Look at verse 31 again. It was preparation day. The Jews did not want the bodies to remain on the cross for the Sabbath, and so they requested that Pilate have the men's legs broken and that their bodies be taken away. The Apostle John tells us it's Sabbath day. It's a holy day for the people of uh, Israel, and it was a desecration for the Jews to have people hanging on the cross on their Sabbath day. The normal practice was to leave them on the cross till they died, which would take a few days, and then let their rotting bodies be picked apart by vultures till their bones just fell to the ground. Or they would simply remove the nails and have their limp bodies fall to the ground for wild dogs to feed on them. 
And so the Jewish leaders, growing impatient, seeing that the sun was making its descent, the Sabbath was about to begin, asked that the death process be sped up for Jesus and the two thieves that were lying next to him. They asked Pilate, would you break the legs of each of these individuals so that they would suffocate and die as quickly as possible? This would prevent them from pushing up their legs, causing their chest cavity to close from the weight of their body. Verse 32. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and the other man who had been crucified with him. And they came to Jesus. They did not break his legs since they saw that he was already dead. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. And so the soldiers, no doubt, wearing this new clothing that they got from Jesus and the two thieves, used these iron mallets to smash the shins of the men on the crosses. Two start on the right side of Jesus with the thief on the right, and two start on the left side of Jesus with the thief on the left, and one breaks the right leg, one breaks the other leg, and we learn that from the other Gospels that the thieves were still alive. They were still, their eyes were wide open, insults were still pouring from their mouths of one of the thieves until the soldier smashed those legs and he dies instantly. And then the other, the one who repented, the one that you guys heard about from last week, who was profoundly taking in this scene, knowing that he was headed to heaven, to paradise. He had his legs smashed as well, and he died. One died, heading to be with the Father in heaven, eventually a new earth. The other died, heading away from the Father in heaven to hell. One had the joy of knowing that his sins were paid for. The other had the misery of having to pay for his own sins. Two very similar men who lived similar lives of hate and murder and insurrection with two very different destinations. Their destination wasn't a balancing of the scales of one was good and one was bad. Both of their scales were way off of balance. Yet one repented and believed in Jesus, the other did not. And now they're dead and the soldiers come to Jesus in the middle and are about to break the legs of Jesus, but they observe that he's already dead. And to make sure he was dead, one of them takes a spear and shoves it to the side of Jesus, causing blood and water to flow out. There have been tests that have been performed on cadavers where the chest was injured in such a way that the fluid, up to two liters of it, gathers around between the rib cages and the linings of the lungs. And this fluid then separates the serum to the top, the red layer of blood at the bottom. And if Jesus was pierced at the bottom of the cavity, of the chest cavity, this is what would have come out. Verse John 10 says, Jesus said this way, I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. But I lay down my life on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it back. Listen, the multiple floggings didn't kill Jesus. Ultimately, he died earlier than where his bones were broken because he wanted to show us that he was sovereign over his own death, just like he said he was. Now, some during the New Testament times believe that Jesus really wasn't a man and that he really didn't suffer, that he was just faking it, that this was him pretending. They argued that he did, he did the same with his death, that he pretended he died. Some today believe that Jesus wasn't completely dead when he was placed in the tomb, but that he was in a deep coma um, from the severe trauma of the crucifixion. Some say that Jesus survived the crucifixion and was somehow able to unwrap himself from all of this clothing that was on him and roll away the stone with his own two hands. And then, all of a sudden, he showed himself up to the disciples and they assumed that he was raised from the dead. And so Jesus just went along with the story. But friends, that cannot be true. The Roman soldiers were standing guard over Jesus at the cross. They were the first to report his death. They were experts at crucifixions. And they would stand to forfeit their own lives if they allowed a condemned man to live. You remember the story of the Philippian jailer in Acts 16? He was willing to take his own life when he thought that the prisoners escaped. They were so sure that he was dead that they didn't break the legs of Jesus and they just thrust a spear into his side and blood and water coming out proved that he was dead. 
And then think about it. Jesus had to survive the massive loss of blood from the scourgings, the nail wounds, the spear thrust, the crown on his head. He would have to survive being wrapped up like a mummy in linen cloths with, filled with hundreds of pounds of spices. And besides all of that, he was in this extremely weak condition. He would have had to endure over 80 hours of no food or water. He would have to have managed to unwrap himself and single-handedly roll away a stone that took four soldiers to put in place. Then he would have to fool everyone into thinking that he walked through a closed door, that he disappeared and he ascended into heaven right before their eyes. This would be a trick that even Hollywood could not imitate. Over 35. He who saw this also testified that you may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows he is telling the truth. For these things happened so that the scripture may be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. Also, another scripture that says they will look at the one they pierced. And so John tells us, hey, listen, these things were prophesied 1,500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 500 years ago, prior to this, and it all came true. 1,500 years prior to this was where the Passover requirement was established for the people of Israel after they came out of Egypt. 1,500 years ago it said, this, blood, this bone that you take to sacrifice, you shall not break any of its bones. And then you go to Psalm 34, a thousand years before the crucifixion of Jesus. And the prophet, the psalmist says, he keeps all of his bones, not one of them is broken. And go 500 years before the crucifixion to a prophet by the name of Zechariah. And we find that Jesus is going to be pierced just as he was in his wrists and his feet and his side. Zechariah says, I will pour out on the house of David, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, a spirit of grace and pleas of mercy, so that when they look on me, on whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for only a child and weep early over him as one weeps over a firstborn. Listen, all of this is prophecy being fulfilled one after another after another. Jesus really did die. Number two, Jesus really was buried. Verse 41 says, There was a garden in the place where he was crucified. A new tomb was in that garden. No one had been placed in it yet. And they placed Jesus there because of the Jewish day of preparation and since the tomb was nearby. So normally... In that day, if a person was crucified, the Jews would not put him in a tomb with other Jewish folks because he would defile the bodies of those lying there. A person who was hung on a tree, according to Mosaic law, was one who was cursed. So the Jews considered bodies tainted with sin, and they had burial rites or burial sites for criminals outside of the city gates. And ironically, in the book of Hebrews, Jesus' body was taken and buried outside of the city because the people viewed him as a sinner. He wasn't a sinner, and yet he was treated as one because he had your sin and my sin on his back. Here was the God-man who had never committed a single sin, who was blameless and righteous, perfect in every way, and yet he is being treated like the worst of sinners and considered by the people a defilement. But you know what? He became sin. He was a sin offering, just like those animals we read about in Exodus and Leviticus that were offered for sins. He had absorbed your sin, so that he literally became sin for you and I. He became defiled like you and I were. This is why Jesus would pray in John 17, Don't leave me like this, Father. Glorify me with the glory I had before the world began. And at the moment that Jesus on the cross cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment, he became, in the eyes of the Father, the most hideous evil thing in all of creation. He became the representative sin bearer. He identified 100% with the sins of the history of the world. And thus, the Father treated the Son as if he were sin itself. Bottom line, he became sin in all of its horror so that you and I would become righteous. See, this is why the Father turns his back on the Son and forsakes him and abandons him. Isaiah 53 says this, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned everyone to our own way, and the Lord lays on him our iniquities, our sins. 2 Corinthians, Paul says it this way, for our sake, 
God made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we become the righteousness of God. See, this is why Jesus and even his body was treated like the worst of sinners. He became all of that you and I were supposed to be, you and I were supposed to pay for our sin. Jesus became you on the cross, which is why Galatians 2 says that you and I have been crucified with Jesus. This is also why the body was taken outside of the city because it was defiled. And the irony is, the religious people thought it was because of what Jesus did, when the reality was Jesus' body was defiled because of what they did and what we did. And now we find in the text there is a new tomb that Jesus has put in. And some extra biblical records say that this tomb was owned by a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. And it's also implied here in the Gospel. And so Jesus' body was taken outside of the city where the wicked, the outcast, the sinners were buried. And yet, it was a nice tomb owned by a very rich man by the name of Joseph. And you know, even that was a prophecy from the Old Testament. Isaiah said in Isaiah 53, they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. And although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. You see, one prophecy after another is being fulfilled in the death, the burial of Jesus, and resurrection of Jesus. The tomb was just like everything else in his life. It wasn't his. It was a borrowed tomb, fitting for a man who was homeless, who had his last meal in a borrowed room, who rode into town in a borrowed donkey, whose very livelihood was based on borrowed money, and, just, and yet Jesus really did die, and Jesus really was buried. Number three, Jesus really rose again. Jesus really rose again. Verse 1 of chapter 20, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene, came to the tomb early while it was still dark, and she saw the stone had been removed from the stone. Now listen, I love that Mary is the first witness of the resurrection. You couldn't make this stuff up if you tried. She's strong proof that the resurrection is real. If you were trying to pull wool over the eyes of society, a woman would not have been the first witness. Everyone in that culture would have laughed at that thought. Their testimony wasn't even admitted in court. And yet Mary is the first witness of the resurrection. Not only was she the first witness, but here's a lady that was formerly possessed by demons, who was probably months, weeks earlier, running down the street, street screaming half naked when Jesus found her. The world would laugh at Christians for saying a woman who was out of her mind was the first witness of the resurrection. Listen, there is no possible advantage to the church to recount that the first witnesses of the resurrection were women. It would have only undermined their credibility in that day. The only possible explanation that the women were depicted meeting Jesus first is because it really happened. See, this isn't the way that you promote a lie. If you were a marketing director for the disciples, you would have shook your head and walked away and saying, this is stupid. This would, there's no way you could fix this. There's no way you could turn around from this. This is the worst marketing strategy in the history of the world if it was a marketing scheme. Now listen, this would have been the first morning that anyone would have arrived at the tomb after the Sabbath and Passover had just taken place. And it was custom in Palestine that you would visit the tomb of a loved one three days after their death. The Jews believed that the spirits hovered over the body for days and, so, and then departed the third day, and so the body was starting to decay. And so Mary wasn't coming to look for the proof of the resurrection. She was coming to visit the body. But she wasn't thinking about the resurrection at all. It wasn't even anywhere near her radar at this moment. And so she flips out when she sees that the stone is rolled away, not in excitement, but she's angry. Verse 2, she runs back to Simon and Peter, to the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, and he says to them, listen, they've taken Jesus from the tomb. We don't know where they put him. It's not, yes, what Jesus said is true, he's rose from the dead. No, it's someone took his body, they threw it somewhere. But listen, remember, Jesus, Mary and the disciples heard Jesus speaking about this over and over. Jesus kept saying, hey, I'm going to die on the third day. I'm going to rise again. 
Guess what day it is? It's the third day. And yet none of them believed what Jesus said, or all of them would have been at least sitting far from the tomb watching to see if Jesus would have come out. But they were all sitting in a room playing cards like nurses do all day, you know? Um, and <laughs> Got to make fun of politicians here and there, right? Some, now I don't believe that. Um, some people believe that this, some people believe even this today. They propose that disciples stole the body and basically propelled up the body of Jesus to act like he really rose from the grave. The Jewish leaders even tried this. They told the soldiers, hey, listen, we'll pay you to fabricate this story. We'll pay you to say the disciples stole the body of Jesus. All of this assumes that people during that time were loyal to their messiahs. There were tons of messiahs in those days who were trying to fool people that they rose from the dead. But that never happened. They always moved on. The idea was just as ridiculous to them as it is in our culture today. There were many messianic movements that would have, where messian, messiahs were executed. And not a single one of them claimed that they were a messiah. I mean, they were going to be raised from the dead. They knew better. They either gave up the revolution or if they found another leader. Claiming the original leader was alive again was not an option unless he really was. Go to verse 3. And at that, Peter and the other disciple went out heading for the tomb. And the two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. And so here we have Peter, and here we have John sprinting toward the tomb. Mind you, it wasn't that they were smiling or anticipating the resurrection. Rather, they were angry and ready to put a beat down on someone who took Jesus' body. They were going to go tag team WWE on whoever stole the body of Jesus. And Peter apparently suspended his gym membership a while back, and so John just outran him really, really fast and got to the tomb. Verse 5. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he didn't go in. And then following him, Peter also came. He entered the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there. The wrapping that had been on his head was not lying with the linen cloths, but had folded up in a separate place by itself. So John looks into the tomb, bends over to see inside, but he doesn't go in. Why? Because he didn't have his wrestling partner with him. And Jesus, if Jesus' body was stolen, which they assumed it was, the thieves could have still been in the tomb. And so he needed Peter to have his back. And so John peeks in just to see if anyone is in there. And all of a sudden you hear Peter chugging along, coming behind him. And Peter doesn't even stop. He just rushes right into the tomb. He blows past John and runs right in, ready to start a fight. And the language says that Peter took a long, careful look and studied the place like Sherlock Holmes would. And he discovers that it doesn't seem to be a heist or that someone came in to steal stuff because the clothes were nicely folded and put away. And Peter is probably sitting there wondering what kind of sick person would unwrap the body of Jesus, take it out, and then take the time to fold up his clothes and put it nicely and neatly. This is not some maid that stole Jesus' body. It must have boggled his mind because the thieves would have left behind, wouldn't have left behind expensive things like linen and spices that could have been sold on the black market for good money. And the idea is that the grave clothes there looked like they had just been pulled off and taken off. They were lying there as if the body of Jesus simply evaporated through them. The wrappings were still at the bottom. The turban was still at the top with a space between them where Jesus' shoulders and face would have been, but there was no Jesus. Apparently, the resurrection body of Jesus passed through the grave clothes, spices and all, just like he will with a wall in the next chapter of John. Verse 8. The other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went and saw, and he believed. For they didn't understand the scriptures that he must rise from the dead. And the disciples returned to the places where they were staying. So John finally gets the courage to walk in. And now that Peter's there. And when he sees the remains of the linen cloth, he believes. He believes what? Everything starts clicking. Jesus said this would happen. Jesus rose from the dead. This is the only possible answer to what they were seeing. And they were trying in every way possible to believe something different. Jesus really died. He was really buried. And he really rose again from the grave. Listen, go back with me. 
because I want to look at one final thing before we close. I want you to look at verses 38 to 40 of chapter 19 because here we discover our last point that Jesus really does change lives. Jesus really does change lives. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might remove Jesus' body. Pilate gives him permission, so he comes back and takes the body away. Nicodemus, who also previously came to Jesus at night, also came, bringing a mixture of about 75 pounds of myrrh and spices, and they took the body of Jesus, wrapped it up in linen cloths with fragrant spices, according to the burial customs of the Jews. Now, so you need to know who these two men are. Joseph was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a rich man. He uses his rank to get access to Pilate immediately. He had used it for self-righteous purposes before his entire life. And now all of a sudden he's using it for the good of others. And then we find a man by the name of Nicodemus. Only John tells us that Nicodemus was there. Nicodemus, we talked about him earlier in our series. Um, he was a young professional. The one who had no limits of what he could accomplish. But Nick was an empty Remember, he came to Jesus in John 3 in the night, humming to this tune of, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And even though apparently he had everything, he was rich, he was young, he was smart, he was all around a good guy, he had the political offices, he was a celebrity of those days, had everything the world could offer. But here in our text this morning, we find him committing social economic suicide as he's saying, I identify with Jesus. Friends, the only possible reason that Nicodemus would do this is because Nicodemus has been converted. He was born again, just like Jesus said in John 3. See, to be born is to be born into, is to be brought into being by the power and strength of someone else. It is through extreme pain and suffering in the blood of another that birthing takes place. Many times moms will die during the birthing process. It was many times life by the death of another that birth happened. And friends, this is what happened to Joseph and Nicodemus. The death of Jesus provided them this brand new life. Just look at the proof of this life. These two men go to Pilate. That was a bold move because remember, Pilate was already looking to arrest the followers of Jesus. They boldly ask for the body of Jesus. They don't care about the dangers anymore. They are also personally anoint the body of Jesus. There would have been an awful stench as Jesus' body was beaten and his bloody with little resembling skin left on him. And in this culture, in this day, only slaves or women did this kind of thing, but not people who were in the upper class, not rich people, not people of social standing. And then they bring 75 pounds of burial spices. Most burials in those days were only one pound. And if you do the calculation, 75 pounds is over a million dollars in today's money. This is why Joseph is called the rich man in the Gospel of Matthew. And here we find something bizarre two highly successful wealthy men who would look like presidents of companies, CEOs or CFOs today. And here they are risking their necks, their reputations, their careers, their lives by asking for the body of Jesus and then not hiring someone else to anoint it but doing it themselves and paying handsome money for the funeral costs. They don't at this moment care about their class. They don't at this moment care about their money. They don't at this moment care about their safety. They don't care at this moment about their status. Only the gospel will cause a person to be transformed like this. These guys were born again. Jesus is not dead. He is surely alive. He is alive and breathing right now. Friends, he has gone through hell and back for you. And through his resurrection, he has vindicated and conquered sin, death, hell, and Satan for you. The resurrection of Jesus was so powerful that it turned men from cowards to heroes, from deserters to proclaimers, from men consumed with self to men willing to lay down their life for the gospel. See, the fact of the matter is, 
Not a single apostle would recant their belief in the resurrection of Jesus. Not a single one. Every single one of them would die holding on to this belief and making them either the most gullible group ever assembled, the most insane group ever assembled, or people just brave enough to admit what they really saw. The Apostle Matthew would be killed by a sword. Mark would die in the city of Alexandria after being dragged through the streets of the city. Luke would be hung on an olive tree in Greece. The Apostle John, who wrote this gospel, was permanently scarred by boiling oil and then banished to the island of Patmos to die. Peter would be crucified upside down in Rome. James, the half-brother of Jesus, would be killed by the sword and beheaded in Jerusalem. James, the brother of John the Apostle, would be thrown down from a high pinnacle and beaten to death with a club. Philip would be hanged. Bartholomew would be scourged and beaten to death. Andrew would be bound to a cross till he died. Thomas would be run through with a spear. Jude, the other half-brother of Jesus, would be killed by executioner arrows. Matthias would be stoned and beheaded. The same for Barnabas and Paul would be beheaded in Rome. Listen, if Jesus rose from the dead, you can't pick and choose what you like or don't like about his word, what you want to obey, what you don't want to obey. He comes as a packed deal, all of you, for all of him. See, the issue on which everything hangs on Christianity is not whether or not you like his teachings or not. The issue on which everything hangs is whether or not he rose from the dead or not. Because if he rose from the dead, we don't get to pick and choose. We surrender and say, God, your will, not my will. If he didn't, this is just a good book of advice for us. This is just, we can pick what we want and ignore others. But if this truth, that Jesus rose from the dead, is true, we come to the Word and say, God, I surrender. I obey. Whatever you ask of me, I will do. Like we sang last week, whatever you say, I will say yes. Whatever you ask of me to do, I will do. Whatever you call me to go, I will go. I will say yes, Lord, yes. This is our only response to the resurrection. This is the only thing we can do in response. We can thank God for it. We can worship Him for it. But the resurrection demands our obedience and surrender to Jesus. As we go to communion this morning, we take an opportunity to pause to sit silently reflecting on the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Friends, if you are a follower of Jesus this morning, would you take a moment to present yourself to him, renew your commitment to take up the cross and follow him no matter what it entails. Friends, he's worth it. He's worth it. Don't just dabble with Jesus. Don't just say, I'll make time for Jesus whenever I find it convenient. The resurrection demands full surrender. It does. You can't reflect on the resurrection of Jesus and say, all right, Jesus, I just have you in my back pocket for when I need you. It can't work that way. The resurrection demands that we say, my life is now yours. Would you take a moment to renew your commitment to take up your cross, to follow him, wherever that entails? 
And then when you come forward to take the bread, which represents the body that was broken for you, and drink the juice, which represents the blood that was spilled for you, these tangible items to help us remember the finished work of Jesus, would you celebrate that he did this for you? If you don't know Jesus this morning, if all of this seems strange, or you have a lot more questions that need answers, we have people in the back that are available to pray with you this morning for people to talk with you, to people to just point you to Jesus, to answer questions for you. And church, if you, you too can come to the back, pray with someone if you need. If you feel the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you just want someone to minister to you, there's people back there to pray with you as well. But would you take a moment? Don't rush up here this morning. Reflect on the resurrection. Is your life surrendered to Jesus? Or are you just going through the motions? And if it isn't, would you take a moment to surrender? Or at least begin to ask the questions of why? And would you begin to process that? And would you let the Holy Spirit minister to you this morning? Father, we thank you that our Savior really died. We thank you that he took all of our sins on his body so that this morning we can sit here today knowing that we can go to your presence anytime because of Jesus. can access the king of king the king at three in the morning as a child and that's what you made us that we can come to you day or night healthy or sick when we have it all together and we when we've jacked it all up knowing we have access to you we thank you that Jesus was really buried. But Father, most importantly, we thank you that Jesus didn't stay in the grave. That he rose from the dead. That he is alive and sitting at the right hand of God. And that because he rose from the dead, lives like Joseph of Arimathea and, Bar and Nicodemus were changed, but our lives were changed. <laughs> thank you for changing us. Thank you that you're still changing us. Thank you that your word says that you who began a good work in us, you will be faithful to finish it. So Father, we surrender this morning and pray that you would be glorified. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.